Good morning, Gordon. It is such an honor to be with you this morning. I have really never had a chance to speak in front of such a large student body before, so I'm kind of in honor. Um, as Carter mentioned, I'm the executive director for Mira. I came into this role a year ago. And a year ago, I was immediately thrust into the world of, an of anti-trafficking and sex trafficking. Within two months, I was quote unquote considered an expert in this field. And all of a sudden, I'm now a leader in this movement in New England. Now that word leader has been a mixed bag for me my entire life. I've had a difficult time for years now thinking and imagining that I'm a leader. I've read leadership books and I just get frustrated. Can I just be a little honest with you for a minute? Leadership books are written by 50 or 60 year old white men for 50 or 60 year old white men. And as a 30 something year old woman, they drive me insane. I'm not jaded, I'm just kind of irritated by them. But here I am, I'm a leader in the anti-trafficking movement in New England. And so I have to figure out all of a sudden what my leadership style is. One thing I know again and again is I really like Jesus. I know that's like a cliche, but I stopped being a Christian a long time ago that just pays lip service to the Bible. And I started taking it really seriously when Jesus tells me to do something. And ever since I've done that, my life has changed. So even though I struggle with the idea of me being a leader, I've realized that if I'm a leader and if I'm going to have any sort of influence over anyone, I'm going to do it like Jesus did. That's my leadership style. There are probably a thousand things that we can learn from Jesus and his leadership through the Gospels. But I want to share with you two things this morning about what it has taken to become a leader like Jesus. And what I do now with the work of Amira because I'm following what Jesus told me to do. The first thing that I know about Jesus and his leadership style is that it starts with prayer. There are at least 13 unique situations in the Gospels where Jesus is mentioned that he is praying. And there are also another eight uh, unique teachings from Jesus on prayer within the Gospels. Now this sounds like a small number, right? It's only 13 times that he's mentioned that he prays. It's only eight times that he's teaching. But this actually really isn't a small number. Because if you look at those references, it's reference that he prays in the morning. He prays in the middle of the day. He prays at night. So it kind of sounds like he's praying throughout the entire day. Ongoing. In Luke 5, it says that he withdraws to desolate places to pray. There's more than one instance where that is said of Jesus, that he withdraws to quiet places to, play, to pray. After a long day, he would go out, he would find a quiet place, and he would sit down and he would be with his father. Jesus did some incredible things. He healed a man who had been blind since birth. He healed another man who had been an invalid for 38 years. He raised his friend Lazarus from the dead after he'd been dead for four days. He took two pieces of fish and five small loaves of bread, and he multiplied those and fed over 5,000 people. He commanded demons to leave people. He healed diseases that had overtaken bodies that nobody could touch. He did all these things, and instead of crashing at the end of the day, instead of like laying down on his couch and grabbing his Xbox controller and playing some Xbox or turning on the TV, Instead of sleeping in the next morning because he was up all night talking to some idiot Pharisee that can't understand what it means to be born again, he wakes up early and he stays up late to pray. He recharges himself by crying out to God and listening to him. Developing a prayer life is not something that happens out of luxury and an abundance of time. Developing a prayer life is something that happens because of necessity. There are days in my job when I am utterly spent. I get asked all the, all the time, what on earth does an executive director do? Right? That title is a little out there. The short answer is everything. I oversee the staff who have their own assignments, they have their own strengths, they have their own shortcomings. And I help them grow in their strengths and I help them manage their shortcomings. I have a staff that help with office operations. I have staff that help with volunteers. I have staff that work directly with extremely traumatized women that have been sex trafficked. So you can imagine the kind of brain capacity that I have to have every single day as all these avenues come at me. 
Then I meet with people on a daily basis to share with people about Amira and the work of sex trafficking, the anti-trafficking movement. I begin to develop partnerships. I raise funds for Amira. I get the word out that sex trafficking is happening right here in New England. And sure enough, every time I spread the word, I meet people that are somehow involved in this on the other side. Like yesterday, I was down at a church in South Attleboro, and I shared with that church about, you know, the movement and what Amira is doing. And I had a woman come up to me afterwards, and she identified herself as a survivor of, of trafficking, that she had been trafficked 20 years ago. I also had an uh, opportunity a few months ago to share with a high school, and I shared with the teachers of the high school to look for signs of trafficking because they were in a population that this was a vulnerable population. So I was sharing with them, giving them tips on what you can look for. And afterwards, one of the male teachers came up to me and let me know that he visits strip clubs and he's a part of this as a John. This is the stuff that comes every single day. I also get to report to an amazing board, like the people that Carter Crockett serves on it and Lori Truschel serve on it. This means I get to answer questions constantly from them, make sure that our numbers are right, make sure that our figures are right, make sure that our facts are right. This means I'm constantly being pointed to our mission, that we're not going aside from that. This means that I have to inspire these awesome people to keep serving on the board because they have full lives as well, too. If this sounds tiring to you, I can guarantee you it is. This is why prayer is not just a ritual in my life, but it is my life. I've come to understand that when Paul tells us that we're supposed to pray without ceasing, that it's because he understood that leading will take every part of you. So you have to open up your heart and your mind and your soul to constantly communicating to God and always being open to listening to him. I think that that is what Jesus did. I think that's because of his prayer life and everything that he did, constantly seeking God, this is why he was able to do the second part of what I think his leadership style is. And that is to love sacrificially. Jesus said in John 15, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus lived this out before his disciples. I've noticed that as I've read through the Gospel of John, this is like a blueprint for how to be a disciple of Jesus, right? It's showing constantly that love that Jesus lived out before every single person that he encountered. And he saw his disciples take that and follow after him with that love. Jesus did miracle after miracle. He spent hours with people, teaching them, healing them, talking to them. And John saw his rabbi, his teacher, go off alone, spend time in prayer, only to have that get interrupted by people again. And he saw Jesus say, okay, there's the interruption. I'm going to love these people. He did all this without any praise or a book tour or a camera crew following around. Jesus had such a deep sense of humility. Miracle after miracle, and there's no grandstanding with Jesus. He didn't become like a diva, you know, like, oh, sure, maybe you can touch my hem of my garment now. No. Jesus simply walked around and did what he knew how to do, which was love people. That's it. Simple acts of love. Taking care of a need. Healing a hurt. Restoring broken lives and making them whole. That was Jesus living out love. And then he hung on a cross for a crime he didn't commit. And that was Jesus dying out love. Love in such a way that you would give up your life for another. That kind of love. Love in such a way that you give yourself for others. Love that gives wholeheartedly. Why do we have this charge to love like this? Because that is what is needed in this incredibly broken world. This is how we can actually lead a broken world to redemption. And Jesus saw this. He saw people who were living in despair and in fear. And he offered them life through his incredible sacrificial love. That kind of love is an outpouring of someone who has loved God with all of their heart 
mind, soul, and strength because it truly takes a supernatural gift to be able to pour out sacrificial love for others. This is not something that can be mustered up by a feeling or an emotion, but it's something that comes from following everything that was commanded by the one who lived and died it out. What's so great about love? I mean, Jesus flat out states that this is the greatest love that's out there. There's no greater love than this. This statement from Jesus can be so incredibly tough, though. What is he actually saying? Is he, is he telling me that I'm supposed to go ahead and take a bullet for my friends? Am I supposed to fly over to Syria and stand in front of ISIS and say, no, 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 chop my head off instead now? What am I supposed to do? I think the answer lies in the fact that Jesus lived this in his life. Jesus lived for others because he displayed this kind of love at all times. It didn't matter how tired he was. It didn't matter how annoying the person was. I love the story in the Gospels where there's two blind men, and they hear that Jesus is coming down the road, right? And they just start hollering, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on us! And all the disciples and all the crowd are like, shh, you're annoying. We're trying to hear Jesus. We're trying to listen to him. He's our rabbi. You need to be quiet now. And instead, these annoying blind men are like, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on us! How annoying is that, right? And here's Jesus. He hears them. He parts the crowd. He walks over to these two blind men. He's like, hey, what can I do for you? <laughs> oh, you want to be healed? Okay, here you go. Let me love you. Let me take care of your need. If there is anyone in this earth that has the right to be annoyed and irritated by people and how needy they are and how troubled they are and how their stories that are just so heartbreaking can break your heart and make you not want to get out of bed, it's Jesus. I mean, people are needy, and that's like normal people. People are needy. Imagine working with extremely traumatized individuals, like, say, women that are sex trafficked, or drug addicts, or the list can go on and on. Needy, hurt people. What on earth do we do with them? Jesus has the answer. You love them. And not whatever you think love is because you watched some movie, but the love that I showed you. The love that was there when a crowd of 5,000 people were hungry and looking for food. The love that was there when for 38 years a man is sitting there getting passed by person after person after person because they don't want to help him. The love that shows a woman who's bleeding for 12 years and has nowhere to go and no one to turn to. That kind of love, the love that when God said, my will is for you to die in order that everyone else might have a chance to live. That love. Love them with that kind of love. To wrap our minds around this, we have to realize that our motives and the power that will enable us to do this cannot come from ourselves. This is actually true leadership. Recognizing that I will never be able to love people on my own. And by my own power. In fact, I'm pretty sure if I tried, I would fail every time because I'm an introvert and people make me tired. To find this motive and power, this enables us to love, is truly significant. I think this is a community of Christians who understand that because Jesus loves them, they are so completely healed inwardly by what he has done for them. That love becomes the natural byproduct of a spiritual healing. I shared with you at the beginning that I've had a hard time with thinking of myself as a leader. These are the two things that I know that I have to do if I'm going to lead. I have to have a prayer life. And I have to love sacrificially. I can promise you, I don't go walking around telling my staff and everybody I meet, hey, I'm a leader. That's really lame. In fact, I've never actually used that word in front of anybody that I work with or the women of our safe home. I've never used that word. Each day, though, I take on the challenge of Jesus. And I develop my prayer life. And I love 
like he tells me to love. A few months ago, we were celebrating the birthday of one of the women of our safe home. And she is somebody that she likes to do things for other people. So even though we might be celebrating her, she's going to give gifts to you. It's one of those really cool people. And so we were celebrating her birthday, and sure enough, she had a gift for every single person in the room. She made rocks. And so she had these rocks, and she wrote on them a word for everybody that was in the room. And so for all the other women that were there that had been trafficked, she gave them each a rock that said survivor. And that was so incredibly special. For her case manager, she gave her a rock that said fighter because her case manager was fighting for her. And I was the last person that she was giving her rocks to. And she came up to me, and the rock that she gave me said leader. I can promise you I've never once told her I'm your leader. I'm, I, you have to follow me. I have merely prayed for her, and I've loved her like Jesus told me to. Because of that, I've been able to see part of her life be redeemed. About two, three months ago, she started coming to church with me. And she started to ask questions. What do you mean, this, you know, God loves me? What, what does that mean? Who, who's God? What's Jesus? What's happening here? And after a few weeks of going to church and a few weeks of her asking these questions, one day she said, I'd like to go pray. And we went down to the altar, and we prayed that she would receive forgiveness from God. Last month, I was able to baptize her. And she is now understanding fully that God loves her, and she will never be bought and sold again. It's absolutely amazing to see. You are Gordon students. I've heard nothing but high praise about you guys, which I know is pressure. <laughs> but I know so many Gordon grads and, and the amazing things that happen because you've come to this place and you've had such a great education, you've been challenged to become something more than just ordinary. And so I speak today about leadership because I know that there are so many leaders in this room that in 10 years, you're going to be doing amazing things after you've served your time in your 20s. 20s are horrible, by the way. <laughs> but after you've served your time, you're going to step forward and you're going to become leaders in the business world. You're going to become leaders in anti-trafficking movement. You're going to become leaders in social justice. You're going to become leaders as lawyers. You're going to become leaders as whatever, as teachers, as in education. You're going to become leaders as missionaries. You will become leaders. You are incredible people. Stop listening to what the world is saying leadership is and look to Jesus. This is how we lead people in a broken world. This is how we lead people from darkness into light. Because no matter where we are, that is our calling. No matter what avenue you find yourself in, that is what we are supposed to do. And so you can lead by learning that your prayer life is the number one thing that you will ever need. And you can lead by learning that you have to love people no matter how much they irritate you. And no matter how needy they are. If you do this, then we will change the world. Because this is what Jesus has called us to do. Can I pray for you? Father in heaven, I thank you so much for this student body. I thank you so much for every calling that you have here in this place. I thank you so much that you are a God that hears our cries, that you are a God that sees us in every detail. And I thank you so much, God, that you have made incredible men and women in this place to do incredible, extraordinary things. I pray, God, that you would help them to know you, for there's nothing better than that. I pray, God, that no matter where they go, they would go with you. And I pray, God, that you would challenge us all to speak with you, to hear from you every single moment of every single day. For we can't know your will unless we know you. 
I pray, God, that you would help us to love like you loved. Give us that sacrificial love that lays down our needs, our desires, our wants, and looks to the good of the other person. Help us, God, to do this so that this world will know redemption. I thank you so much, God, for your son, what he has done, because he is the only reason that we can live today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.